Um, it's a great pleasure for me to chair this uh, new session on labor markets and, and industrial policy. And um, we will have the speakers almost in the order as they appear on the, uh, on the agenda. So first we will start with the presentation by Jakob von Weizsäcker. Um, he's the head of Department for Economic Policy and Tourism in the Economics Ministry of Thüringen. Then we are happy to have John Schmidt from the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, D.C. And then you may have already noticed, um, we do have a problem with a third speaker, unfortunately. Well, <laughs> we, we had one. <laughs> we thought that we would have Rainer Hoffmann, but unfortunately he became ill, and we are very happy that we have an excellent substitute, so to say. <laughs> um, Andreas Botsch um, agreed to jump in and replace him, and it was really on very short notice, so he only knows it I think like one hour or two hours. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, and I would suggest that we directly start with a presentation of Jakob von Weizsäcker. The floor is yours. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Um, of course, uh, joint challenges call for joint solutions. And um, this morning uh, we had a number of excellent presentations discussing in particular uh, the, the financial sector and, uh, and I think it was very well described uh, how it certainly needs fixing. I think we're still some way away from having solved that problem. Um, I think in this session, to some extent, we are going to discuss the question, now if hypothetically we had managed already to fix the financial sector, um, would uh, all problems be solved? Uh, and of course, uh, the answer is no. Uh, and um, I, I, I want to use uh, 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 Damon Silver's remark on, uh, you know, what's, what's the next challenge ahead? And perhaps something, it's, it's, it's a serious challenge, but it could, be, could actually be quite helpful for, for other reasons. And, and that's, of course, the challenge um, of, uh, of global warming uh, and the question of how, how to deal with that. And uh, um, well, I don't want to. And give you give you PowerPoint slides. I don't think it's needed. But um, uh, the, the first point I wanted to make, uh, clearly from a transatlantic perspective, we all know that uh, the take on global warning, warming and how to go about dealing with it is remains very different um, on on both sides of the Atlantic, and we know it. Uh, and I think it would be foolish to 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 to, uh, to develop a, a vision for how to deal with it that abstracts from that problem. But, but nevertheless, I mean, I think it's clear there needs to be a, 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 a technological transformation, an infrastructure transformation, and there needs to be a lifestyle transformation. And, and those are not substitutes for one another, they're complements. Um, and, and the main reason for that is the enormity of the challenge. Um, I think uh, just with one of those three, um, we simply wouldn't manage. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and there may be different waves across the Atlantic, but certainly, uh, um, certainly all of them are needed. Um, in that kind of transformation, uh, and that's uh, there I want to come back to the financial sector, there will be winners and there will be losers. And uh, it's always important to remember that. Now, uh, one of the roles that the financial sector sometimes organized a bit better, sometimes organized a bit worse, has always played, and it's not uh, uh, the worst of its roles, is the role of a scapegoat. When there are losers, when there are problems, when somebody uh, suffers and, uh, and somehow somebody needs to be accused because of it, uh, then, then it's always nice to be able to blame the financial sector. It's, it's more or less anonymous, it's uh, not very accountable. Uh, and certainly governments don't particularly like uh, um, being blamed. Um, I think t cit citizens don't want to blame themselves. So having, having the financial sector as a scapegoat uh, has historically been extremely important. Uh, I think uh, it, 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 it is important today. Uh, um, I mean, look at, uh, look at, the, uh, look at the euro. Uh, you know, there's, there's a question. To what extent would we prefer people in Greece uh, com only blaming, I, I don't know, uh, um, somebody in Brussels or somebody in Berlin for, for, for their problems and not at least partially the financial sector. 
Uh, um, I mean, they're certainly blaming people in Brussels and people in Berlin, and perhaps not always for, for wrong reasons. Uh, but, uh, but it's very difficult to manage, uh, to manage su such a transformation without the uh, scapegoat and perhaps also the discipline, the disciplinary nature of that, that comes along with a well-functioning uh, financial sector, and we mustn't forget it. But it, it certainly, uh, I think there's widespread agreement that it's not by, by some sort of a miracle that a fixed financial sector will make sure that we'll be able to deal with global warning, warming. And so we need, uh, we need something much more than that. And we need to give um, guidance to uh, political guidance. Uh, we need to give guidance from uh, civil society and so on. Guidance how this transformation uh, can come about. And uh, I think clearly, uh, industrial policy uh, can play a, a significant role in that and uh, I just want to give, I don't want to bore you with the details of Thuringia. It's a beautiful place, uh, uh, um, uh, it has two million inhabitants, uh, um, uh, one of the most beautiful cities there is Weimar. I'm also in charge of tourism and I can encourage you to come to, 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 to Weimar. Um, but uh, uh, we, have a, we have a tremendous challenge, um, also a transformational challenge related to what I uh, mentioned uh, on, on, the, on the transatlantic dimension, which is the challenge, how do you convince businesses in an area that is projected to lose um, roughly 20% of its population, uh, possibly a little bit more um, uh, until 2030, um, if you add um, aging to that, uh, then of course the workforce is, is, is shrinking dramatically. Um, you don't have any big business hubs in terms of you know, uh, big agglomerations, we have relatively little on offer. How do you convince uh, um, a business that this is the place to invest, that this is a place uh, to have a future? And uh, we did an exercise in industrial policy, if you like, in sustainable industrial policy, um, trying to solve the coordination problem that comes with that. Um, it's a co coordination problem. We're, I don't know, technical universities, they need to think about uh, what do they want to specialize in? Businesses need to think about uh, where do they locate? Uh, um, uh, employees need to think about their careers. Um, and now it may, look, it, it may look a little bit odd to really go into the sectors and say we have 11 sectors where we expect, uh, I don't know, um, 11,000 jobs to be created in this sector, uh, 5,000 jobs to be created in that sector within the next 15 years. Uh, it may look strange um, because, of course, we are not a planned economy, but it turns out that the kind of discussions that one is having, even though we don't have very powerful instruments, we do have some instruments to subsidize uh, investment and so on, we don't have very powerful instruments, but the kind of discussions that you have with all the actors that you need to coordinate businesses, research institutions, infra there's infrastructure question, um, that, uh, that we're having because of that plan, which isn't a plan, it's, it's, it's a scenario uh, and we have no means to enforce it, but the kind of discussions that we're having, the kind of institutions we're creating, for example at universities, the kind of uh, new agglomerations that are being created, for example we have a green tech campus now uh, at, uh, at a, la a rather large motorway crossing called Hamstorfer Kreuz, which wasn't, uh, what, what wasn't really there before, um, shows that it can have an enormous uh, transformatory power. Uh, and, and, and so, yes, we shouldn't shy away um, from going down that route and even make very detailed projections, uh, being fully aware that they're projections, being fully aware we're not a planned economy, so that certain coordination problems can be solved more re readily and perhaps not only uh, by the financial sector and uh, not only even though that would be highly, highly desirable, by means of, I don't know, international treaties or gl a global uh, uh, carbon market and, uh, and all these things. I think they would be great, uh, but we're a long way away uh, from having them. And so I think, uh, I think uh, um, industrial policy and also fair labor market policy, and le let, me mention, let me mention one specific aspect uh, uh, um, on fair labor market policy, it's a minimum wage debate. We are uh, in East Germany quite a way behind um, productivity levels, still um, behind Western Germany, roughly 20%. Now, it depends how you measure it, roughly 20%. Uh, now, we're campaigning for a unified minimum wage. 
Um, that can be a problem. I mean, um, uh, uh, most of you, I guess, are economists here, and uh, um, you know how, how, how good a minimum wage is to some extent uh, depends on uh, at what level it is. Uh, and uh, and the, the ideal level for the minimum wage depends on your productivity to some extent. Uh, and, um, uh, and so it's, it's an ambitious thing to do to say we campaign for, for a minimum wage which is uniform across the country. Of course, you don't have that in the US. Uh, you have uh, state level minimum wages as well, and some of them, as far as I know, are binding. Uh, so it's not, uh, a, um, it's not like that in, in the US. And the reason why it's extremely important uh, for East Germany is not because if we introduce it tomorrow, it's going to have the same impact in Stuttgart as it has in Mühlhausen, which is a small place in Thuringia. The reason why it's important is because it sets uh, expectations. When people make uh, uh, lifetime decisions, are we, for example, going to leave Thuringia and migrate elsewhere, or are we going to stay? If the um, message is, within the foreseeable, foreseeable future, uh, we um, bank on uh, continued con economic convergence, then that's a very powerful signal. And so fair labor market policies can also play an important role in coordinating, uh, coordinating expectations. Um, now these are very general remarks. I want to um, end on a very specific remark. Um, uh, a lot has been talked about Austerians and uh, I know that there are a number of prominent critics of, of the German debt break uh, um, in this room and uh, um, I, think, uh, I think all these uh, um, arguments, they're very important. Um, but I want to show out in the context of what I've just outlined, I want to, um, uh, I want to sketch a partial way out um, without even doing away with the debt break to do with transformative infrastructure investments. Um, as you know, that's the same in the US as in Germany. It's not true for uh, everywhere in, in, in Europe. We have extremely low interest rates. It's a shame, in a sense, to uh, not to use these extremely low interest rates for uh, some very substantial uh, investment in areas where returns are higher uh, than, uh, than, than real interest rates. Um, and uh, um, so, so infrastructure, um, in, 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 in many ways, brings to mind. Now, what's more, and I'll give you a concrete example, uh, the power grid. We're trying to transform our energy system. And one of the things we need, if we have all these windmills up there, one of the things we really urgently need is, 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 a, is a, more, a, a better power grid. Uh, and, uh, and that requires substantial investments. Um, uh, um, and uh, 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 the way we currently organize it is that the power grid is privately owned. It's completely regulated, of course, because competition, for obvious reasons, can't work. Um, what they're getting, um, these private operators, they get a 7% safe return plus extra return to reward them for risk taking. And the risk taking is basically a regu regulatory risk. I mean, there's no real risk. It's basically a regulatory risk. Now, this is absurd in a situation where, um, where, where the, the, the real interest rate for the German government is, is basically nil. If you, if, you, if you look at sort of 20, 30 year um, uh, financing horizon, it's, it's very, very low. So you're giving, you're giving away something to these private operators for no good reason. And what's more, within the debt break mechanism, as long as you have revenues that make the asset that you invest in uh, something that in principle you could sell in the market, it's fine. Um, you're allowed to do that. Um, uh, um, uh, just uh, um, Gustav Horn is, is, is wondering whether that's true. And now, uh, uh, the reason why it's true is, of course, initially the, the, the fathers of the debt break said, we don't want the government to be able to reduce its deficit by um, selling telecom shares. Um, but it turns out, at least at the federal level, it's symmetric. If you buy telecom shares, that's fine as well. It doesn't, I mean, you have to borrow money because you need money for it, but you don't have to, um, but it, it's, it's not counted as part of the debt limit. Now, uh, as long as you make sure that buying, I don't know, infrastructure, because it has a revenue stream, is a, in principle, market, marketable asset. It's legally possible, and it's not a loophole. 
it's, it's intentional. It, 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 it was designed that way. You can easily say, well, we, we do a massive infrastructure investment, but it's off budget. It's off at least the debt break. It's not strictly speaking off budget, it's off the debt break. And if you look at the um, electricity um, investments that uh, um, we need, if you, know, I don't know, even in areas such as broadband, I mean, to my mind, it's not, it's not at all clear that all that infrastructure needs to be owned by private cable operators or telecom companies. Um, you know, building it, the government, of course, shouldn't build it. Uh, I, I think it would be very efficient to have civil servants dig up the streets. But owning it in a situation where there's such a discrepancy between um, the cost of finance for, for the government and the cost of finance, fi finance in, the, in the private sector seems obvious, an obvious thing to do. Uh, and that applies for other infrastructures as well. It applies for roads, it applies for rail and so on. And it's certainly something um, in Germany we should think about. Uh, and uh, and uh, um, uh, um, of course the, the environment in the US is a little bit different and, and the regulatory framework is different. But I think having, um, having some sort of an infrastructure consensus emerging for that major challenge ahead could be very helpful. And that's something that could happen uh, that could happen in, in, in the short run. And, uh, and with, with that specific proposal, I, I want to finish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, the uh, Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation for uh, having us here today, having me in uh, particular. I want to thank them for that. Uh, to the IMK and also to the AFL uh, CIO, the other organizers today. Um, I uh, have a particular challenge today, which is that this is a panel about industrial policy, and I come from a country that has no explicit industrial policy, so that might limit uh, what I can talk about. But we have no explicit uh, industrial policy, but we have a very much an implicit industrial policy if you look at where we spend our money in tax expenditures and direct expenditures. Uh, we subsidize the fossil fuel industry. We have very strong uh, intellectual property protections, which uh, promote pharmaceuticals, software, movies, uh, music industry, the gaming industry, which is even bigger than the movie industry. Uh, we provide very large subsidies to the financial sector, something that we have discussed uh, this morning uh, in the form of too big to fail, uh, low interest rates for extended periods of time in recent years, uh, and uh, all sorts of tax expenditures to encourage savings. Uh, and then uh, another one that's near to my heart is uh, we subsidize the housing uh, and construction industries uh, by a mortgage interest deduction. Uh, I just bought a house and uh, I'm astonished at the difference it's making in my taxes uh, from uh, last year to this year. So uh, the point is we do have an industrial policy. We tend not to talk about it uh, and it is not a particularly democratic one. In that kind of a context, and particularly given the lack of regulation of the labor market, I want to shift the focus to another uh, issue which I think is tied into the question of industrial policy, and that is the question of full employment. Uh, and I want to make uh, three simple points uh, today, given that there's 12 minutes uh, to speak, and in my experience, if I blink, most of the 12 minutes are gone, although I have heard that uh, people uh, hearing me speak, think that it goes on a lot longer than 12 minutes, so uh, I'm going to try and be as clear and quick as I can. Uh, I just want to make three points today. Uh, the first is that the United States has operated well below full employment for most of the last three decades. Uh, the second is that high unemployment is a major contributor to inequality in the United States. And the third point I want to make is a little bit more speculative, and I offer it in the spirit of uh, some conversation starter. Um, and that is that we have a lot to learn from the unsustainable booms that the United States experienced in the 1990s in the second half and in the 2000s. In particular, uh, that they tell us that it is actually economically feasible to have faster growth. We just need to find sustainable ways of providing the aggregate demand. Uh, so let me work through these three points uh, showing you some graphs and charts. So first, uh, the US has operated below full employment for most of the last three decades. Now, the U.S., particularly in the 80s and the 90s, had a reputation as the jobs machine that was creating jobs at a very fast rate because of our deregulated labor markets. And uh, I think 
that at least in the 80s and 90s, there was probably some truth to that. Uh, we did create a lot of jobs relative to our population. Uh, but I think it's also important to keep in mind that we have operated below full employment for a long time, uh, most of the last uh, 30 years. Uh, this graph uh, shows in the dark dotted line uh, the C Congressional Budget Office estimate of the natural rate, uh, which is the term they've just started using again after a long time of using uh, the more familiar non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, the NARU. Uh, but in point of fact, if you look at the calculations of the natural rate that they do and the NARU, they're basically exactly the same. So consider it whatever you want, uh, but I will use it as a benchmark for full employment. Uh, and you can see uh, in that central line that the uh, the natural rate hasn't moved a whole lot uh, in their calculation. Uh, and you can see in the blue line what the actual unemployment rate was. And uh, if you go back to 1979, which is about midway through, uh, for most of the period since then, the United States has been well above the uh, s standard estimates of the natural rate. Uh, so we have a lot farther we could go. Um, I want to put that in a little bit more quantitative terms. So I'm basically just taking the numbers from here and uh, you can see that there's a total number of years that have, from 1979 to 2012 is 34. Uh, of those, in 11, the U.S. was at or below the natural rate. And uh, in 23, it was above the CBO's estimate, the Congressional Budget Office estimate of the natural rate. Uh, but it's not exact, that's bad enough, but if you actually weight the uh, distance by the amount of unemployment, the amount we were above or below, the uh, picture looks a lot worse. If you multiply the amount of unemployment times the years, you get unemployment rate years, and uh, in that period, about 5.4 uh, years were uh, unemployment years, we were below the CBO's rate, uh, and for 36.1 unemployment years, we were above. Uh, so the net total is strongly in favor of being well above the natural rate. Uh, now, the reason why I uh, want to emphasize this is because we have, I think, uh, uh, as I said, a reputation for being very good on creating you know, something close to full employment, but we actually fall far short. Uh, now, why I think this is important is not just because of the lost output. It's because it has a very big impact on economic inequality, and that's the second point I want to make. Uh, when we have low unemployment, the economy does much better, and it does much better for people at the bottom and the middle than it does, relatively speaking, for people at the top. So uh, just to give a quick way of illustrating that, I want to compare the period from 1995 to 2000, which was the biggest boom in the post-war, well, not the post-war period, but in the post-1979 period, the second half of the Clinton administration, basically, uh, with the period 2007 to 2010. Um, which is uh, that 2010 was the absolute low point of the recent uh, Great Recession in the United States. Uh, and you can see uh, the big differences. The first two bars show, uh, compare the average unemployment rate in the two periods, 4.6 versus 8.2. The second two bars show uh, the change in the unemployment rate, so it fell about 1.6 percentage points in the boom, uh, but it rose five percentage points in the bust. The next two show that this was approximately mirrored by the experience of the employment to population rate. And then the last two uh, sets of, of graphs show the inflation rate in the two periods. And what's striking here is that there's actually not a very big difference, 2.3 versus 3.2%. Uh, and then the, the last set shows that the increase in the inflation rate over that period was about 9 tenths of a percentage point, and the decrease uh, in the recession was about 1.2 percentage points. So we're not seeing any sign of either accelerating uh, either high or accelerating inflation. But what was the impact on the distributional side? Uh, again, and this to me looks like, uh, well, this basically shows the change in real family income, adjusting for inflation using the CPI, uh, at the 20th, 40th, 60th, 80th, and 95th percentiles of the income distribution. Uh, and the light blue graphs at the top show that the 20th percentile family did quite well in the boom relative to workers in the middle, or to families in the middle, uh, and almost as well as families at the top. Uh, but what's particularly striking is in the downturn, the uh, income distribution became much more unequal. Uh, so people at the bottom benefit in booms, and they are disproportionately hurt uh, in downturns. Uh, this is not simply a question of, of uh, kind of uh, inequality across the income distribution, 
uh, but also it has a, an effect on inequality across other dimensions. So this graph shows the similar kind of relationship looking at changes in the poverty rate by race and ethnicity. Uh, you can see in the first two sets of graphs what happened to the overall uh, f U.S. federal poverty rate. Uh, in the boom in the 90s, it fell two and a half percentage points, which is very uh, big decline. There's very few policies we could ever imagine implementing in the U.S. context that could reduce poverty that quickly uh, or that much. Uh, and uh, it went up a lot in the bust uh, in the most recent period. Now, if you see, though, the declines in poverty or the improvements in poverty in the booms and the busts were much bigger uh, for blacks and Latinos, which are two groups that are particularly disadvantaged uh, in the US labor market. Um, now, part of the reason for these two results is just that there's more work to do. There's more weeks of the year people are working. There's more hours in a week that people are working in a boom. And the reverse is true in a bust. But it's also about bargaining power. Uh, when there's a low unemployment rate, workers have much more bargaining power, and they're able to command a better uh, set of outcomes. Just to make this point in a simple way, this is what happened to the real wages of workers who actually had a job uh, across the booms and the busts. And uh, this shows the 10th, 50th, 90th, and 95th percentiles of the wage distribution. So 10th percentile is a pretty low wage worker. Uh, in the boom at the end of the 90s, real wages increased 11.1%. Uh, which was higher than at any other point in the distribution. Uh, and similarly, when the bust hit, uh, workers at the bottom were the most uh, damaged by the decline. And uh, I think that that goes to the question of bargaining power. When the unemployment rate is high, workers, particularly at the bottom, have very little bargaining power. Uh, and when the unemployment rate is low, they're in a much better position. Now, the third point that I want to make is, uh, as I said, a little bit more speculative, a little bit more uh, just to have a bit of conversation, uh, perhaps. But, uh, but I, I strongly believe it, actually. Um, and that is that I think that there's a lot we can learn from the 90s and the 2000s booms uh, in the United States. Uh, they were financed by asset bubbles in the 90s, by a stock market bubble in the 2000s, by a housing market bubble. Uh, but I think that they show that it is possible to have demand-driven uh, booms. Uh, and what we need to do is find sustainable ways of doing that. So I just uh, to make the point here a little bit more clearly, if you go back to the 1990s, uh, the neighborhood was widely believed to be about 6 or 6.5%. Um, if you read Paul Krugman in uh, 1996 or 1997, he certainly believed that and made that point regularly that we couldn't really go below a certain level. Uh, yet, as, as we saw, inflation barely increased uh, over the boom at the late 1990s. Uh, and that was certainly the case in the 2000s with the housing market. We saw no significant increases in inflation. Um, and it, I think, raises some questions about estimates of the Nehru in the European context. Uh, if you think about the experience of the, mid, the early to mid-2000s in Europe, uh, there were a lot of people who said it was not possible to have the kinds of employment growth and reductions in unemployment uh, that took place. Now, retroactively, a lot of those same people said uh, that this was po only possible because of the labor market reforms that had preceded it. But of course, and I think we saw a little bit of this this morning in Akim's uh, discussion, you know, those same people were saying in 2005 or 2003 or 2007 that it was impossible to proceed without better increases uh, in, uh, without more uh, labor market reforms. Um, so uh, what I do think is that, that this suggests that, uh, that booms, the experience of booms in the United States suggests that what is missing is aggregate demand. But obviously what we need is some sustainable aggregate demand. And I think sustainability in the short term depends on having uh, uh, macroeconomic policy, stabilization policy that works, that is counter cyclical. Uh, and in the medium term and the longer term, it requires industrial policy and a shift towards some sort of wage led growth, topics that we've talked a little bit about earlier today. Um, and just to conclude, um, I, I think I want to leave you with three thoughts. One is that what is missing uh, right now is aggregate demand, um, not additional labor market reforms. Uh, we were able to have booms in the 90s and the 2000s despite being told we couldn't in the United States, precisely because we didn't need any more labor market reforms. Uh, and I think that's true elsewhere. Um, I think that what we need to find is sustainable demand, um, and that's the key to finding full employment and maintaining it. Um, and finally, um, I want to emphasize that full employment is extremely important in reducing inequality. 
Uh, and I think that this is particularly true in less socially regulated labor markets, such as the United States. And I would just add that it's increasingly true, I think, in Germany, where you have uh, ratcheted back significantly on labor market protections. Uh, and I think it might serve as a possible lesson for thinking about the future here. So thank you very much. I might suspect, um, being totally unprepared uh, on this panel, I don't have any slides, uh, which is un unfortunate because I could have shown a few slides. Uh, but what I'm going to say um, is uh, actually in reacting to the discussion we've had so far, because it links up with uh, uh, both the panels on uh, macroeconomic policy this morning and on uh, financial markets, as well as to uh, the remarks that uh, both uh, Jakob and John uh, have just made. Uh, let me start with my first point. Um, industrial policy, uh, as opposed to uh, this uh, long period of financialization that uh, we've seen uh, over the last uh, 20, if not 30 uh, years, um, I should perhaps remind participants here in the room that the last two social democratic ministers of finance in Germany, uh, Hans Eichel and Per Steinbock, uh, were, both of them were convinced that industrial policies did not matter. Uh, they were convinced that uh, industry uh, was old fashioned, was outdated, and uh, that uh, this was partly also responsible for uh, the low levels of growth that uh, Germany uh, had seen uh, after re re reunification, uh, and in particular in the first part of uh, uh, the, the, the 2000s. Uh, so both uh, the focus on industrial production and uh, uh, you know, combined with uh, a very rigid labor market uh, were, were the two sources of evil. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, uh, you know, uh, policies uh, went for uh, deregulating uh, the financial sector. Uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, brought in consultants from the banking sector uh, to draft laws and, uh, you know, free uh, the uh, uh, free banks and finance from 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 regulation. Uh, the aim was double: making Frankfurt a continental city of London, or a, you know, a com direct competitor with uh, Wall Street, London, and Singapore. Uh, and uh, also uh, freeing banking and finance from the shackles that uh, policymakers felt were imposed by the dominance of uh, the big manufacturing industry. So they lifted the ban on hedge funds, on real estate investment trusts, and uh, uh, by and large uh, lowered uh, the, the standards of uh, supervision. Uh, as a result, we've seen an explosion of uh, banks' balance sheets, uh, uh, in, uh, not just in Germany, but uh, almost everywhere in the EU. Uh, and they uh, nowadays amount to four times uh, uh, the amount of the US, namely 350% on average for, for the EU, ba banks' balance sheets. Uh, and uh, so, first point, uh, Germany and uh, uh, most of Europe was following more the Anglo-Saxon model of uh, financial capitalism. Uh, then came the crisis, and then we've seen very different uh, uh, approaches to uh, crisis resolution. Uh, across Europe. And for the first time in 30 years, I think, uh, in Germany, um, which is totally atypical 
for the usual German uh, stance of uh, monetarism. Um, we've seen uh, such a thing as a fiscal stimulus that uh, was politically decided uh, in, uh, I think, uh, at one evening uh, in December 2008. There's a witness of this uh, meeting in the room here, Gustav Hahn, uh, in the German Chancellery. Um, but this was also prepared in beforehand by uh, union leaders uh, making uh, sort of roll calls uh, to uh, CEOs uh, to get support uh, for a fiscal stimulus. Uh, because it was generally acknowledged that uh, this was totally out of uh, uh, the usual uh, agenda uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, why has, it, has this been so important? Because of the increasing export dependency. Uh, German industry has increased its export dependency uh, from 40 to roughly 50 percent in just one decade. Uh, and uh, also uh, because uh, the forecasts were so terrible that uh, you would have expected a huge increase in unemployment uh, uh, through the crisis, which simply did not happen. Uh, we've seen a historical, uh, a historical fall in GDP of more than 5, percent, uh, five percentage points uh, in the year 2009, with uh, virtually no increase in unemployment. And this was done by a very clever combination of first the fiscal stimulus and a very you know proactive uh, labor market policy uh, labor market policy which in technical terms you can you may call labor hoarding which was uh, actually uh, happening uh, in uh, you know labor economists speak uh, you would call it a focus on internal as opposed to external uh, labor market flexibility uh, assisted through income support schemes, subsidies for uh, short-time uh, work schemes, Kurzarbeit, but also through increase, increasing uh, 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 training and retraining. Uh, and uh, I think I don't know whether that uh, word exists in English. Uh, it certainly, does in French. Uh, uh, the leitmotiv of that, the guiding principle, was to maintain uh, confidence uh, in the economy. Um, third point, perhaps even some of the German participants here in the room may be surprised to hear that to what extent social partnership uh, had a massive role to play. Um, and associated uh, with that is, uh, you know, the, the model of uh, co-determination at company level and worker participation at enterprise or shop floor level. And without that, I think, uh, or with a more, you know, uh, confrontational approach, uh, the German economy would not have managed uh, to get out of uh, the, 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 the deep trough uh, of, uh, of the crisis. Uh, for a climate of confidence to you know, build up and uh, really function on a longer term, you need a long period. You know, confidence is not, not uh, something that you, you know, can build on from scratch, but it's a long-term relationship, both at company level and at sectoral level. Uh, and uh, this was particularly strong in uh, all the export sectors, uh, automobile, uh, mechanical engineering, chemicals, pharmaceuticals. Um, and uh, it was actually uh, actively taken up by uh, collective bargaining uh, policies uh, from the unions, uh, where uh, the unions discovered that they could combine uh, cyclical problems and the more long-term uh, structural problems 
which uh, they started to tackle in collective agreements on uh, demographic change, for example, uh, which uh, I think uh, uh, is important for the more uh, you know medium to long term uh, development of uh, of companies. Since the immediate crisis uh, resolution uh, was becoming you know, less important because everything was back to normal, almost back to normal, uh, you know, current account surpluses in Germany skyrocketing again uh, to pre-crisis levels. Um, and uh, you know, German industry becoming highly competitive and the model uh, for the rest of Europe. Uh, I'm not saying this is my, you know, my own view, but this is uh, you know, the general per uh, perception. Um, there is obviously a problem when much of Europe is now what Richard Kuhl has called a balance sheet recession. Uh, balance sheet recession, uh, which is characterized that uh, almost all private economic agents, public and uh, private, uh, uh, no, uh, private economic agents, uh, both households, companies, and uh, uh, the rest of the world, so foreign demand, uh, when they are uh, retrenching. Uh, all at the same time, uh, and uh, you know, public budgets are then uh, uh, having a choice uh, what to do, uh, whether uh, they would uh, make up for for the loss in in, in aggregate demand uh, that uh, John Schmidt was referring to, uh, or whether uh, they would just let uh, the the economy slip. Uh, further into uh, recession, um, and um, I'm aware that I've got very limited uh, time, uh, but uh, I think there are a few key, uh, you know, lessons uh, from that crisis that uh, uh, we should be we should be drawing in, uh, uh, not just in Europe but on both uh, sides of the Atlantic. Um, First, we will only be able to get out of this balance uh, sheet recession uh, through uh, uh, growth combined with uh, a lowering of income disparities. Uh, second, in order to achieve this, the, the corporate sector will have to accept lower rates of uh, profitability uh, and there's a key role for trade unions to uh, uh, to make this uh, uh, an issue, um, uh, just in brackets, uh, we now uh, have in Switzerland uh, a huge uh, discussion going on on the marginal productivity of management, uh, which is defined as ma a maximum of 12 times uh, that of an average uh, worker in, in the same company. Uh, so limiting uh, 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 management uh, uh, salaries and bonuses. Uh, Fourth point, um, tackling widening income disparities uh, requires a new discussion on uh, progressive income tax systems, uh, so taxing the rich, uh, but then also uh, uh, imposing uh, levies on, on, on wealth, so a, a substance levy, uh, and all that uh, with the aim to restructure and modernize uh, the European industrial landscape. Uh, I don't have the time to dwell on this any further. I just want to uh, 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 draw your attention to a European recovery plan that uh, the German uh, Trade Union Confederation, DGB, has set up, uh, which uh, may sound enormously large in volumes, uh, equivalent to 2% 2 of GDP uh, 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 investment, uh, mainly but not exclusively uh, for an energy turnaround uh, in, in Europe. Uh, we could get back to this maybe in, in, in the discussion, but it is a very you know, detailed plan 
to make, still make active industrial policies under the conditions of the German debt break and the European uh, fiscal treaty, which leaves a lot less margins of maneuver for, for public budgets. So it's got to be funded or financed by uh, uh, the, private, uh, the private sector. I'll stop here. Okay, first of all, let me thank you all for your interesting um, comments and statements. I know this is, you had very little time for a very broad topic, uh, so I would suggest that we have first two internal rounds where you, uh, before we open it to the audience, and then these first two internal rounds, I would just like you to find some common grounds uh, or to see if we have some. And uh, you can use it to quickly comment on the other speakers uh, and comment if you have a major problem with a statement or see it differently. Or if you would agree, for example, um, that you think that low income inequality is important, that uh, you would agree to the one statement that we've seen what is missing is aggregate demand, not more labor market reforms. Um, stable aggregate demand. And we had a second issue that I would like to, to take up. Um, so do you all see a, a, an important role for public investment, uh, especially for environmental issues like, um, or you had, we had the example for, for the energy sector. Um, is there something, or is that something you would also agree upon or not? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I want to bring out perhaps one one point a little bit more clearly. I, I, th I think we have um, we have a great opportunity because traditionally there has been a little bit of an intellectual divide across the Atlantic uh, between people who are really hot on production and people who are really hot on allocation. Uh, you know, people who really think trade is going to solve problems, perhaps financial sector is going to solve so allocation and fine-tuning the system in which you allocate, and, and then sort of the more European, perhaps, uh, perhaps engineering type perspective, uh, where you say, you know, you tweak the production of your, your I don't know, turbo diesel motor, and then that, that, that's going to solve uh, the problems of the world. Uh, and I think what the, the, what the crisis has done is uh, somehow made these world views converge a little bit more. And I think it would be, um, it would be a missed opportunity, and that's not at all criticizing, uh, John, what you've said on, 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 on some of the um, uh, very much open macroeconomic questions that, that we are confronted with. But I think it would be a shame if now after the crisis, uh, somehow we, we, we then start to have this kind of uh, very much economists debate between people who really love uh, micro foundations and people who love macro foundations and, 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 and I think that would miss this opportunity. Uh, and um, when I hear the word uh, industrial policy, to me this is not about, um, not, at least not um, um, mainly about you know, this macro versus micro debate. For me it's, it's a debate where finally uh, if you like engineers and economists, people who worry, I mean, uh, that's a problem we've had for a very long time in, in the US and Europe. In the US for, for quite a while, funding science, funding research was really only possible to get it through Congress if, if it had to do something with the military. Uh, and, and, uh, and here in, um, in, uh, um, uh, in Europe, we have great trouble. I mean, we've had this, this 3% um, R&D target, 3% of GDP in, in, in the EU for a very long time, <laughs> but uh, I don't think we've made any progress at all since. And part of it has to do, I mean, everybody pays lip service to, to these targets, um, but it's not happening. Um, and so, so I think uh, in having engineers and economists talk about, uh, talk about these questions, perhaps with this unifying theme, of, um, of global warming and what to do about it would be extremely, extremely helpful. That's perhaps bringing out uh, in a uh, hopefully sufficiently nuanced way some of the, uh, some of the uh, interesting and hopefully productive differences that I can see on the panel. Uh, 
thank you. Um, the, uh, I, I, maybe I'll just comment uh, on the question about the labor market reforms versus aggregate demand and link it to something that came up this morning uh, in, uh, I believe it was when Gustav was making some comments. Um, there is, a, it seems, a space for interchange about uh, you know, econ national economic experiences, and in particular, have economists and other experts on economic policy to, to weigh in. Um, and I just would propose a, a, maybe a suggestion, a challenge uh, to uh, our German colleagues uh, about a slightly different case than the US uh, uh, German case, and that is, um, I think about the case of Spain where uh, the right in Spain currently uh, believes that if you do the equivalent of, in Spain, of hearts reforms and you have a balanced budget, that you will have a German-style outcome in Spain. Um, I find that personally extremely hard to believe, if not impossible. Uh, I mean, Spain, with its current labor market institutions, was the most rapidly growing uh, employment uh, country, you know, in the OECD, uh, up until the crisis hit, they were increasing jobs at five percent a year. It doesn't seem to me that their labor market institutions were impeding uh, job creation, uh, and uh, they also had a, you know, relatively uh, sound financial uh, fiscal deficit situation. It seems to me there's a real opportunity for some of the German economists here today to go uh, and maybe set some of the debate straight in terms of what's happening in Spain. Um, I think that would be extremely useful, both for the people of Spain, but also for the future of Europe, to be able to say there's uh, a way other than austerity, and that's not exactly how we did it here in Germany. Uh, two remarks on the, on the first point, uh, income inequality. Uh, obviously, uh, when there's a lack of uh, uh, domestic aggregate demand, uh, um, uh, you, I mean, the, the traditional model has been to you know, uh, uh, go for export-led growth. Now, uh, the US consumer uh, is, uh, I think, for the foreseeable future, uh, not ready uh, to play uh, the role that uh, uh, they've played uh, over 20, 25 years. Uh, so uh, there would have to be, uh, you know, uh, more domestic-driven, uh, uh, domestic demand-driven uh, growth uh, in the future, rather than you know, uh, hoping for uh, one big economy acting as uh, a hoover uh, for all this uh, excess <coughs> capaci <coughs> capacity. Now, if we look at uh, uh, assets that are currently under management in the EU, uh, they amount to uh, almost uh, three times uh, EU uh, annual GDP. And uh, what to do with this uh, excess capital? I mean, the, also, uh, the traditional answers have been physical destruction through war. Uh, I don't think we, we would consider this as a viable solution anymore. Uh, secondly, through privatization of public goods, uh, that's also no longer an acceptable uh, you know, way to, to proceed, uh, at least it meets more and more uh, resistance. Uh, third possibility, create a new bubble. Uh, okay, that's always an option, but it's not a sustainable one. Uh, so uh, that leads me to, this, to your second point, public investments. When monetary channels are broken, as we've seen this morning, and I, I think as Richard Koo uh, very eloquently uh, shows in all his, his graphs uh, on, on, on the different uh, uh, industrial countries, uh, then uh, there is a role uh, to channel uh, private excess capital uh, towards investment. Uh, whether there is a role of you know, public investment uh, to the extent that uh, we would uh, wish uh, it to be, you know, there's different answers uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, you know, Europe uh, has you know, um, uh, taken on uh, very harsh and uh, rigid uh, uh, shackles to, uh, to fiscal expansion. Uh, in, in, in the fiscal treaty um, and uh, so the role of public policy would be to uh, use uh, 
the enormous wealth uh, that's out there, uh, tax it uh, or uh, channel it through a system of incentives uh, because all this private capital uh, despe is desperately looking uh, for returns uh, which uh, 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 they're about to, to, to find in, in, in the equity market at the moment. We've seen uh, record, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, DAX or uh, uh, Dow Jones uh, indices uh, in, uh, you know, like pre-crisis, uh, at pre-crisis level. Uh, but if that's going to burst again, uh, then people will actually not know anymore where to put their money. So public policy's role would be to channel uh, this excess uh, private wealth into uh, productive uh, investment. Okay, thank you. Um, you partly mentioned the different traditions, but um, you also said that there would, was a convergence of approaches. As the official title of this conference is uh, the Transatlantic Agenda for Shared Prosperity, I'm wondering if you see any chances or even the necessity of uh, <coughs> transatlantic cooperation or co coordination of policies in the topics we have here in, in the area of uh, industrial policy and the labor markets, or would you say that it's interesting to talk about the differences and the solutions that have been taken to different countries, but um, this is something that should be solved nationally, um, it's so different that, there, and, and maybe there's also no need, in your opinion. But if you see a need for stronger cooperation, coordination, uh, how could that look like? We only had this morning the presentation of Jan Prive, who directly suggested something for transatlantic cooperation. But would you see it in these fields that we're talking about? I mean, I, I think I think if one accepts the basic idea that uh, that uh, that what was behind my argument uh, that um, uh, um, we need uh, we need, if you like, an industrial policy um, uh, uh, and uh, and certainly much more than that in order to deal with the problem of global warming and uh, and, and and if you accept that global warming is a global problem. Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, in an ideal world, uh, it wouldn't just be transatlantic cooperation, it would be global cooperation to, to make this happen in a, in a meaningful way. And now we're a long way away from that. And unfortunately, even though I'm, I'm, I'm a great transatlanticist and, and um, fondly remember my years in, in Washington, D.C., uh, um, uh, um, it's probably not, uh, it's not uh, behind the corner. I don't think we'll have a... Um, major, very meaningful cooperation um, on, uh, on, on this major challenge uh, within the next five years. I mean, I, I, I find it hard to imagine. I could even imagine a situation where, I don't know, Europe um, makes some headway in, in, in cooperating um, um, on that challenge with some of the countries in Asia, and then at some point uh, it becomes easier because of some sort of an implicit competition uh, to all of a sudden um, have have meaningful transatlantic cooperation. Now that's that's of course uh, um, uh, um, that's that's of course uh, um, uh, in a sense depressing in a, in, a, in a transatlantic setting. But so I don't I don't see this happening uh, anytime very soon. Um, but as with most things, I, I mean discussing them and uh, and certainly not the first time we're discussing. Uh, uh, in this, discussing them again and, and looking at the different opportunities and the different nuances and perhaps having some uh, cooperation in the field of, or, or at least uh, parallel action in the field of infrastructure development and the way the technologies perhaps we use and, and so on, um, that, that's a very good starting point. Uh, so yes, we need it. Uh, we're a long way away from it. And, and even in such, uh, in principle, easier things as, uh, as um, uh, cooperation in hard science, we have this absurd situation right now where the EU has a major project to um, research the human brain and the US has a major project to research the human brain. As, and from what I understand from some of the people involved, the coordination on something as basic as that is, is certainly not as good as it should be. 
Uh, so there's a lot of improvement um, in, in, in the area of transatlantic cooperation, but I'm optimistic that it will happen. Uh, I think one of the speakers this morning, and I confess that I don't remember exactly who it was because I'm still a little bit jet lagged, uh, made the point that uh, we already have a certain amount of transatlantic cooperation, in particular among the financial sector, which has been defending its interests quite well. Um, I think a, a topic that didn't come up in the discussion this morning about the financial sector, which I think would be very helpful to address at some point, uh, and goes to this question of, of the opportunities for cooperation, is, the, uh, is, is the, one of the barriers that I think prevents uh, kind of the international labor movement and the folks that, that uh, the international labor movement represents from uh, coordinating and, and uh, searching for an agenda for shared prosperity, I think is the increasingly close ties between the parties that the international labor movement has traditionally uh, allied itself with as defenders of uh, the working class and middle class people in the United States and the financial sector itself. Uh, so if you think about the transformation of the Democratic Party in the United States or the Labor Party in Britain, those are two parties that are very closely tied now with the financial sector. So a lot of issues that could be put on the table are pushed aside. Uh, and I recall the meeting that we had in Washington just a month ago where there were several uh, certainly upsetting uh, examples of the role that key operatives in the Democratic Party and, and even the current administration had played in blocking uh, sensible reforms to uh, the U.S. financial sector. So I think that's an issue that, that, uh, that at least in the U.S. and in the U.K. we need to address. I'm not sure how far it extends into the other European countries, but uh, I think that that is something that there is a basis for a common shared agenda, but I think that there are some roadblocks that we need to, to think about in a constructive way. I think it would be worth uh, while trying to identify uh, uh, a list of, you know, not just common uh, interests, but a, a list of uh, common uh, social needs that we would identify on both uh, sides of the Atlantic. Uh, you know, the, 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 the traditional approach has been to, you know, uh, look at the strengths and uh, possibly returns on equity and so on. Uh, but if we're not starting, if we're trying to build up a, trans, a transatlantic progressive agenda, which I think would be high time to do, um, because we've been dominated by a transatlantic, you know, neoclassical or neoliberal agenda uh, over uh, 30 years. Uh, if we start from identifying the social needs and what it implies for uh, industrial policy to, you know, uh, stay, stay, stay uh, with, with the subject of, of, of this panel, I think there's a number of areas uh, where we can, you know, immediately start uh, working on uh, in a in a interdisciplinary uh, uh, manner, uh, be it by you know identifying uh, standards, uh, standards in uh, energy efficiency, for example. Uh, I think for most European countries, Californian standards uh, for the car industry are still regarded as you know, totally uh, exaggerated. Uh, uh, you know, command and control uh, uh, economy like and so on. Uh, I think there's a lot of common ground that needs to be explored in, in more detail uh, and which may, act, which may be more complicated than just, you know, talking about the general principles of macroeconomic policy, which I think we all, you know, uh, 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 like very much to do. Uh, but when it comes to identifying the needs for public investment and to re-establish uh, the role of uh, fiscal policy, uh, wage policy, uh, and uh, tackling uh, inequalities, uh, then uh, there's huge uh, there's huge uh, amount of work to do. Okay. Um, questions from you were first, second, third. Well, this was a really interesting, uh, 
fascinating discussion on industrial policy. And there was a lot of points that I wanted to bring up, uh, raise maybe about the issue of uh, your, your achievements in employment here relative to the U.S., even though you had, uh, you know, negative growth for a while, but you didn't lose out on, uh, your unemployment rate didn't go up. But the one I guess, after listening to everything I wanted to focus on most, is the issues around industrial policy and the uh, green economy. And I want to make a few uh, observations about that and then throw it out. I happen to be in a situation right now where I've uh, just completed a very long-term study on uh, green industrial policies for the United States, and it's hopefully about to be published soon. And right now I'm also directing a project for uh, UNIDO on comparative policies around the world, including uh, the German case. So when I do this work, it's, interest it's so interesting to hear your comments because to me, Germany stands out as the, the shining example uh, that if we want to talk about learning from each other, that if the US could learn you know, one-tenth of what Germany's already achieved, uh, we would be very well off. I mean, just as a simple example, you talk about energy efficiency. Uh, the U.S. operates at, at twice the level of energy consumption and, and carbon emissions per capita as Germany. So if we were to undertake, as I hope we will, a massive uh, air, uh, investments in energy efficiency over the next 20 years, if we're lucky, we'll be at the level of uh, energy consumption per capita that Germany is today. Uh, so uh, that's one thing we could learn. So maybe when you have your next conference, we could just uh, kind of extract in the United States that example. Um, another example is in you know, your debates around the use of nuclear power uh, that, and the commitment to I mean, this isn't even, you know, seriously in discussion in the United States that you actually are going to run an advanced economy uh, on uh, clean energy within, within a generation. That is, I understand. There, I know there's fudging around it, but even that you talk about it, that you're going to run an economy uh, on renewable energy, that you're not going to depend on nuclear power, and uh, you're going to keep improving your efficiency, which is already twice as high as U.S. efficiency. And I want to mention one other thing that I think could be extremely important, because this is uh, uh, a major issue in the area of uh, energy policy that is confronting us today in the United States, and that is the issue around uh, fracking and natural gas. Um, the U.S. administration, which makes very nice, uh, you know, and, and does good things in the area of uh, green investment, but also does some very bad things. And the worst thing, which they're about to do, is promote, or is doing already, is promote the expansion of uh, natural gas production around fracking technology for the reason that it's, it, it, you can extract natural gas inexpensive, inexpensively through fracking and that the costs are going to come down quite a bit. But the environmental impacts of this are uh, disastrous. They're disastrous uh, in terms of the groundwater contamination. They're disastrous in terms of the uh, methane uh, leakages when the gas gets, go, goes through the pipeline. But even in uh, burning the uh, natural gas, it's a myth to think that natural gas burns clean. It does not burn clean. It burns cleaner than coal, but that's not saying very much. Uh, it cannot, we cannot hit, hit our uh, energy, uh, our global warming uh, targets on uh, emission reduction if the United States is allowed to continue uh, the expansion of the uh, natural gas production through fracking. That's just a given. And uh, it's, a terror, it's a very big fight, and so therefore a lot of leadership uh, from Germany could have a major effect on our debate. I say this from personal experience because my, even my own study, uh, I can, I, without mentioning any names, I can't barely, I hope I'm going to get it out from the people that have sponsored it because they are afraid to put it out because of, I say in the study what I just said here and they themselves are afraid of, of saying exactly that thing which everyone knows obviously to be true. 
So uh, leadership and having uh, a more discussion uh, led by people who are so far ahead of us on this area of industrial policy would be quite beneficial. Do I all ask you to try to keep it quick and short? Thanks. Just a very quick remark on the issue of productivity and wages. Uh, Jakob uh, Weizsäcker mentioned uh, that there should be a link. On the other hand, one should notice that uh, measuring productivity in the service sector is very uh, problematic uh, in the national system of accounts. It's often uh, out, uh, input based. You take the costs, sometimes the markup. In public sector, the markup is zero. Uh, so uh, you have no independent productivity measurement from uh, uh, the output side compared to the input side. This has the effect that, for example, you have in the public sector no productivity growth ex definitione. Our pr former president Zimmermann uh, took the conclusion, therefore, public servants always should have zero wage uh, increases simply because uh, he didn't understand this uh, uh, context. And uh, it's obvious, uh, for example, if you would go to a barbershop to have a haircut, uh, wages would increase, let's say, by 10%. Uh, if you would put it into the national accounts, costs would increase accordingly, and productivity would increase uh, similarly. So <laughs> there would be, based on national accounting, no problem with productivity. On the other hand, uh, you could say uh, when you have uh, to compensate for below uh, hard sphere uh, payments, uh, the, the transfers necessary to uh, subsidize this uh, employment would be uh, uh, diminished or uh, just uh, disappear. So, so probably taking the balance, it could be a, a free lunch in some way that it's just financed by <coughs> wages in contrast to transfers from the social security system. Uh, so just a, a, com a very brief comment, which is that um, in response to John's point about um, the Democratic Party in the United States being captured by Wall Street, it's an explicit objective of the AFL-CIO to reverse that. And our strategy in the last congressional election was aimed at doing that, at, at, at putting all of our, put the, putting the labor movement's resources to work to specifically support candidates who did not have Wall Street money. I have a question, though, that really takes up on Jakob's uh, uh, remarks earlier, and I would ask maybe Heike and, and Andreas if they would uh, respond or, or comment on this. Uh, if the objective of this meeting is to try to find uh, common ground toward shared prosperity, and we recognize some of the obstacles that are involved in viewing these issues very differently, even between progressives in uh, in the United States and, and particularly in Northern Europe right now. Uh, and looking at, the, let's say, the differences between even President Obama's economic posture and the posture that the SPD seems to be going into the election with. I, I'm, I'm really interested in the prospect for using the infrastructure investment arguments that Jakob made as a way of trying to bridge these gaps. And in particular, the following problem. In the United States, even fiscal hawks, austerity advocates, agree that we need to have more public investment in infrastructure. The way they would like, the way the, the austerity hawks would like to fund it is by essentially a zero-sum fiscal game, meaning, tra meaning moving resources from, for example, social insurance, uh, or perhaps the military, and people have different views on whether that's a good idea or not, but moving resources from one to the other. If one thinks about this in the context of growth, that's not going to be very helpful. Right? It's not going, it's, if, if we have a demand problem, that's not going to help very much. If we could achieve a consensus, is it possible to achieve a consensus in this area among the voices here that it would be a good idea to borrow to invest? It might not be a good idea to borrow to dig holes in the ground, but it would be a good idea to borrow to invest, and particularly to invest around climate and, and the large-scale transformation necessary there. Is, that, is, that a, is, there, is there genuinely an opening here in that direction? Uh, 
I would like to focus a little bit more on the regional problem or regional problems in Europe and the new regional problem in Europe, perhaps in the United States uh, too. In the 17th, we had a discussion on regional economics, regional policy, also in the United Kingdom, before the Thatcher area in Germany too, in the Schiller tradition. But now the regional problems are, have become much stronger in Southern Europe, Eastern Europe too, and we have, I think so, we have no real discussion on this dimension of industrial, not only industrial, policy uh, in Europe. I think we need, uh, as an alternative to austerity, a new kind of uh, regional green European New Deal or European Keynesianism. Uh, we are working, uh, especially in, in, in uh, Northern Westphalia, where I come from, but I think there's also discussion and a practice in, in Eastern Germany to, to develop new instruments like uh, revolving funds uh, to use uh, the uh, money much more for investment, for regional investment, regional development, much more effective. But uh, I'm repeated, we have no, I think so, also here until now, real discussion in economics on this subject. It's a bit of a follow-up on Damon's remark and uh, perhaps a challenge to Jakob. I fully agree with Jakob's point that uh, we should have more public investment and I think, and I think even the, the German hawks on fiscal austerity would admit that. And the way out you outlined is that uh, we could do some more green investment in the power grid, for example. And you said it would be possible to borrow it because it's not counted for in the uh, deficit procedure. Uh, I'm not so sure, Jakob. <laughs> I think first we should ha we must have to buy these firms. Then we could do it. Is that your proposal you're making? <laughs> okay. Um, I hope I didn't forget anyone. I would then ask all the speakers to comment on the questions, we had something about can the US learn from, or the US should learn from Germany about energy efficiency. We had a comment on productivity in the public sector. Um, the question if we do all agree that public energy or infrastructure investment should be debt financed. Um, the uh, statement that we need a regional green European New Deal and um, the comment from Gustav Horn, or rather a question directly to Jakob von Weizsäcker about yeah, how, this, how the government uh, should do it and if he agrees that they should buy the company. Um, I would ask you again to each of you sta give a statement or comment on the question. Uh, four very quick um, uh, comments. The first on, on energy policy, um, fracking was mentioned, and um, uh, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not unhappy that we don't uh, engage in frantic fracking in, in, in Germany, uh, and who knows, you know, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not an expert in this area, but perhaps technological developments mean that one day uh, it, it becomes attractive, uh, taking all the costs that, uh, um, uh, that, that there are into account. Uh, one day, I don't know, um, if Russian uh, gas dries up and we don't want to use too much coal um, and, and technological pro progress has been, been done, we know a lot about fracking, uh, why not extract some gas uh, if, if, it's, if it's reasonably safe? But, um, but I'm very happy that we don't do it now because I think, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, we have better alternatives. Uh, and secondly, uh, uh, you know, it, it, sometimes the argument is made all these things are also, uh, um, um, also have something to do with security of supply. Uh, and, and frankly, in terms of security of supply, it would be good to have some domestic gas available for times when you need it just as it might have been good to, um, I don't know, keep some of the North Sea oil uh, in the North Sea um, for times when there, there are real problems in, 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 uh, in the Near East. Um, and of course we didn't do that. Um, and the reason why we didn't do it is because we're impatient. You know, if you're, if you're a UK government, 
uh, and you're keen to get some revenue, uh, you you take uh, you take uh, the oil out uh, um, uh, while while you can, uh, and uh, and and um, uh, um, similarly you have uh, people in the U.S. who say drill baby drill or I don't know. So um, um, that's uh, it's completely understandable, but I think it, uh, there are good reasons to be patient. There are good um, there are good ecological reasons. There are good economic reasons. Um, and they're, they're perhaps they're even good security reasons not to rush and, and do a lot of fracking. So I very much agree. Um, I think there are lots of things we can learn in, in Germany too. And uh, I give, on energy, I, I want to give a specific example. We have made the decision to phase out nuclear for good after some complications. And I think that's, that's there to stay. We haven't really made the decision whether we're going to do a significant degree of renewables plus uh, coal as a backbone, or whether we're going to um, go so far as to say, well, coal is not uh, the medium-run backbone provider of electricity in Germany. It's a decision that hasn't been made. And, and frankly, if we end up um, uh, saying, well, you know, we, we get out, out of nuclear because we don't like it, we pretend we're really keen on climate change, but in the end we do a little bit of renewables and then we do coal. Uh, you know, it's not going to look pretty. Uh, and, and I think um, um, uh, getting, uh, getting a little bit more consistency into that reasoning. Um, I, think, I think our plans right now, they're more or less consistent, but they're not definitely fixed yet, uh, even though we sometimes make you believe that's a serious issue. So I think we can learn from some of the debates elsewhere uh, and, and that's an example I wanted to give because otherwise it might look a bit asymmetric across the Atlantic and that's of course unrealistic. On um, uh, productivity and wages, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, mention it because now the optimum level of a minimum wage depends a little bit on your productivity profile in your workforce. Uh, and, and we have a gap there within Germany and it's a gap that is significant. And it may look a little bit odd, you know, to say, well, we want the same kind of minimum wage um, as, as people everywhere else. You know, if you, if you make the extreme argument, having a universal Europe, uh, minimum wage across the euro area, I mean, clearly it would be crazy. I mean, either it would be laughable because it's so low that it's not binding anywhere, really, uh, or it could be positively dangerous for parts of Europe. Um, and, and that's why I mentioned it, uh, and so I don't want to get into the details on, you know, productivity and wages. I just want to explain why, why I brought it up uh, and, um, uh, and, and explain that because of demographic challenges as, as, as a medium-run target uh, uh, that may be implemented in a, even a shorter period of time, that's part of our industrial policy, if you will, or vision for Thuringia. Um, on, uh, on public infrastructure, I, I mean, basically, I agree with what has been said, and I just want to answer Gustav Horn's question. Um, I think it's possible to buy them, and the reason is um, that they have a refinancing um, uh, uh, interest rate, which is much greater than the refinancing interest rate of the state. So the net present value in terms of their um, uh, um, uh, calculation and the private sector calculation um, of that infrastructure is much lower than the net present value if you use the um, uh, interest rate of the government. Um, and, and, and now, of course, uh, you shouldn't fall into the trap in paying the private sector what, what you as a government believes is the correct price. You should pay the private sector what itself believes is the correct price. And, and then it, I think it's perfectly feasible to create, create a Netz AG. But I don't think that's, uh, legally speaking, I don't think it's, it's strictly speaking necessary. You know, you can, you can set up a new entity um, and uh, um, provide it with a revenue stream and as part of uh, um, the funding of that entity that invests in view of the future um, and clear cut and by the way, completely regulated regular, uh, uh, revenue stream so it's in the government hands to make sure that this works out um, is, is um, I think it's perfectly feasible and uh, I, uh, the answer is I wouldn't be against uh, a, a Netz AG uh, for Germany, no. I think that could very well be part of the package. Um, and for the revolving funds, I just want to mention it. Yes, it's an, it's an important instrument, but, I, but in the end, given the greater scheme of things, a technical, technical issue in my view. These are the comments I want to make. <coughs>
Uh, I just want to echo uh, a point that Bob Pollan made, which was the tremendous uh, opportunity for us to learn in the United States from the German experience with renewables. Uh, and I'll give a very concrete and absurd example uh, of something that happened exactly at the time that we had the conference, uh, the first conference in Washington. There was a report on uh, Fox News, which uh, is, you know, I, I suspect you know one of the worst uh, news out outlets in the United States. Um, the, uh, either the day of the conference or the day before the day after, uh, where they explained to their viewers that the reason why Germany was so far ahead of the United States in terms of using solar power was because the sun shines much more in Germany than it does in the United States. I, I'm not kidding. You can look this up on the internet and watch it on YouTube. Uh, and it has nothing to do with uh, a, a economic policy decision uh, uh, to uh, make investments in this area, promote it, and make it successful. Uh, so what I'm saying is there are a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of opportunities to educate the U.S. public and uh, U.S. policymakers on these issues. So it would be extremely helpful. And I'd like to link it to a point that Jakob made, which is in the current context, of course, with interest rates so incredibly low, this is absolutely perfectly time, uh, you know, perfect time for us to make the large scale investments that would be necessary. And again, to hear that from outsiders who have concrete success and experience, I think would be very helpful. Um, actually, um, energy policy, uh, be it on the production side or the consumption side, uh, tends to be uh, a lot more contentious than uh, you would think uh, it to be at first sight. I think uh, the most difficult uh, discussion between uh, French progressives and German progressives uh, tends to stop all of a sudden when it comes to energy policy. Uh, because of the, 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 the hugely you know, different, differing uh, approaches in, in, in the two countries. But regardless of what you think of nuclear and whether there is or not is such a thing of uh, peak uranium or regardless of what you think of shale gas uh, fracking, uh, I think energy policy is actually quite a huge long-term industrial modernization or long-term industrial policy project uh, for all uh, countries where there is uh, a significant uh, industrial base or where, where there is an industrial base. Uh, and I think that would, would deserve uh, you know, more, more exploration uh, uh, in, in, in the detail. The only thing I can say is that there are a number of very intelligent ways to make yourself less dependent on fossil energy uh, imports, which, you know, in the case of Greece, uh, costs what half of uh, uh, is, is makes up half of the uh, the import uh, uh, bill uh, for, for that country, uh, and uh, as long as uh, you know, uh, we we are not you know uh, technologically that advanced that we can rely on 100% uh, uh, renewables, which I think is a very uh, valid uh, objective. Um, there's uh, you know ways of intelligent combinations uh, in 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 an energy mix uh, there, uh, but it is if. It is a very important, if not the most important, driver for uh, reindustrialization or for re for a, 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 a re uh, for, for renewing the industrial landscape uh, on, I think, both sides of the Atlantic. Short remark to Damon's question: Of course, it's a good idea. It's not just a good idea uh, to borrow. Uh, to invest, but it is an absolute necessity. What I was referring to is that uh, with you know exporting the German debt break to the whole of Europe and having such a thing as a fiscal treaty which is fundamentally you know uh, which has a fundamental deflationary bias uh, you 
I mean, you can fight that, and it is necessary to fight that, and to you know explain why uh, it is sheer nonsense and uh, economically and socially damaging. But at the same time, you need to explore new models of how to mobilize private capital for the objectives that you have uh, in, in the immediate future. It will take some time, I can guarantee, I'm afraid to say, it will take some time to overcome the foolishness of, uh, well, the German export model, uh, uh, which is German monetarism. And uh, as long as we haven't achieved uh, this uh, fight, or we haven't won that battle, uh, we need to think of alternative ways of you know, getting to uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, investment that, that we need uh, to overcome uh, this uh, secular uh, crisis. Okay, um, thank you very much for your very interesting and insightful comments and contributions. Um, I'm hesitant to make a summary because we did not really fully discuss everything, but we do seem to agree that it's a perfect time for public investment, uh, probably for green investment, and uh, also there's a need for that uh, with regards to global warming. and. We probably agree on more, but this may be then left for the coffee break. And thank you again, and have a nice coffee break.